So thanks a lot. Uh, we'll quickly move into the next pasture of the program. We are just moving to the final leg of the program. So may I now invite uh, Justin and Mark to do a duet yes. on uh, what do you think was the outcome? And of course, why CSV become a strategic imperative for business? Over to you, Mark and Justin, please. OK, well, thank you. Um, thanks, Amit, uh, for this. It's funny sitting up here with Mark since I spend a lot of time with him. <laughs> so, uh, but I don't think we've ever actually been maybe on stage together. Uh, you know, my first kind of reflection on today is, um, well, a couple things. Um, first and foremost, just tremendously impressed with the viewpoints, the thoughtfulness uh, expressed today. And allow me for a moment to put this in the larger context of the Shared Value Initiative. So we started the Shared Value Initiative uh, really officially about four years ago, the global initiative, of which the Shared Value Initiative India is our uh, official platform here in India. We started it with a very simple idea in mind, which is that shared value should be a public good. And that the only way that the concept, which seemed to have such resonance with folks around the world, could actually be successful was not by owning it, it was not by keeping it in Harvard or with Mark and Michael, but it was in fact an approach to say we needed to empower all of the people around the world who found promise in this concept, in this framework, in this language, to take it and mold it and use it to their own ends for greater business and social progress. For linking the prosperity of societies with the prosperity of companies. That was where we started. And if anything, today, I think what I'm struck by is, and I'm sure Mark will appreciate this thought, I wish we had started with the richness of folks in this room ourselves four years ago. Because in fact, where we started with our first very modest summit, way more modest than this, was about 50 people in the room, and they were almost all from corporations. And it took us a journey to bring in nonprofits and to bring in governments, but you have that here already today. So I think you're already ahead of where we were, and it, it's just so wonderful to see. You know, I think what I said yesterday at the Partner Day, um, I will sort of repeat uh, before I hand it over to Mark, which is that a, a couple of things. Why do I think that there's imperative for shared value? And that was the question that was posed in this segment. I mean, first and foremost, I think ideas themselves have moments in time. They, they can land at the right moment. And I think when Mark and, and Michael wrote about shared value, it happened to land at the right moment. It built on the work of many wonderful people and organizations, many concepts. And yet it had a resonance in a post-2008 moment with business leaders who were looking for a new way and a new path in which to engage with society's most difficult challenges. I think the wonderful thing about the launch of this initiative now is that, that you already see today that the conversation hovers around how to make this a reality. How? How do we operationalize it? And I can tell you four or five years ago, the conversation was really about defending the idea, defending that it was a good idea for companies to solve social problems and not be viewed as creators of them. And so that dialogue, even in four or five years, has changed tremendously for the better. And, and we benefit from that today. But with that change comes expectations. Expectations of results and delivery from all sectors in service of society. So both great progress and also great expectations. The other reason it's an imperative today, you see this on a day-to-day -day basis, we all do. And that is the proximity of social issues to all of our lives and all of our consciousness. We, we're all struck by this, and it's, it's front and center for all of us. What I used to say 
and this is not a praise to celebrate, social issues are a growth industry. They are. But what you have here are purpose-driven people who want to do something about that. So overall, you know, just really pleased with today and all the folks who have stopped me during breaks. I couldn't be happier with this uh, very specific dialogue and tailoring this conversation to the Indian context and how important that is. Yesterday I mentioned at Partner Day, I was almost embarrassed to admit that I hadn't been to this country that represented about one of five people on the whole planet. But what that meant is that I came here to India, to Delhi, with both great ambition and great humility. Ambition because I think we represent an idea that we believe has promise to change the most substantial social issues of our time. But great humility, because I come to listen and learn from you and the community here in India of people who are gonna change the direction and outcomes in India. So with that, let me hand it over to Mark for some thoughts. Thank you, Justin, that's great. Well, uh, it's been a long day, I won't say much, but uh, you know, I started this morning by saying, the, my best examples of shared value uh, all come from India. Uh, and what has been a real pleasure for me today is hearing more examples, uh, more uh, wonderful stories uh, from the woman starting the bank because uh, someone couldn't deposit uh, three rupees, uh, to um, stories from Nestle and others, uh, at all sizes and all levels of scale about creating shared value in India. And somehow it seems to fit the times and the culture in a way that is very encouraging. But I want to say a few words also about the, uh, some of what was discussed on this last panel about the 2% requirement uh, of contributions to CSR because I think that is a unique opportunity in the world with a tremendous scale of resources at stake in which India can demonstrate uh, to the rest of the world how powerful a model like this can be. Uh, and I would agree with Mr. Chatterjee that the, the place to start is with uh, strategic philanthropy. And I think of examples. Uh, years ago, we did some work with Godrich here. And, um, they, uh, of course, have a line of, of washing machines uh, that they sell. Well, it turns out there aren't enough washing machine repair people and salespeople in the country to support the kind of growth that they foresee. And so one of the things they've done is work with the government to create training programs to enable people to learn how to get these skills and to acquire these jobs. Now, these people are not going to work for the company. So this is not a benefit that goes back to the company employees, but it is in fact strengthening the competitive context in a way that can help the growth of the business over time. There are also partnerships I see with NGOs, where again, the company cannot directly spend money uh, for a purpose that may improve the context, whether it's a bank that wants to improve financial literacy in the region, uh, whether it is other job skill training, but there are ways that companies can fund NGOs to do these things. And what's great about these initiatives, it's not that there's anything wrong with traditional philanthropy, and that is important and serves an important role. But again, it creates that self-fulfilling cycle that uh, I talked about this morning with shared value, where the benefit does not just go out to meet an immediate need, but contributes to a stronger economic context for that company and for other companies in that industry. I also think there is an opportunity, as the CSR law becomes more established, to refine the regulations so that shared value opportunities and initiatives actually can begin to qualify and count. And I think one would see a great rise in the enthusiasm from business for this requirement 
if business was actually able to use this in a way that is constructive. The challenge, of course, is how do you tell what is just business as usual investment and what is shared value investment? And the answer is, if you can see a material change on an important social problem, then it is shared value. And whether or not the CSR law is modified to permit shared value investing, I would encourage in future evolutions the lawmakers to focus not so much on the amount of money given away, but on the result achieved. What is the problem that the company has set out to tackle? And what difference has the CSR contribution made toward that problem? And when you begin to reframe it, not in terms of spending money, but in terms of solving problems, then you really do open the door to shared value. Because it becomes clear when a company is making a difference on a social issue at scale. So I, I offer that thought. It, it is not for me to come from America to India to tell you how to govern uh, or how to manage philanthropy and CSR. But I offer that thought only because I sincerely believe that India can uh, become a leader for the world in showing the world what companies cooperating and motivated by government can achieve. I, I also want to uh, echo what Justin said. There is no single model for shared value around the world. It depends on the government and the companies and the industries and the social issues and circumstances and economy of each region. And the important thing about the Shared Value Initiative India is that Indian companies and NGOs and government ministers can begin to come together and figure out what shared value means for this country, where the alternatives lie, how it fits within the business context and the cultural context of this country. So, like Justin, I am uh, so proud and so excited by the momentum that is here today. And I really want to congratulate Amit for making this happen and for being uh, such an extraordinary and visionary leader uh, for this country. So with that, I will uh, conclude, but thank you very much. <laughs>